Hello, everyone. You're all very welcome to this webinar. My name is Jan Sorensen, and I'm the director of the Healthcare Outcome Research Center here at the RCSI School of Population Health, and I'm a professor of health economics. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this webinar. This is the first webinar in a series of four seminars that we are having uh, during the year. This is the third year that we are arranging a webinar series. Some of you might have taken part in the previous years where we have focused on value-based healthcare and cancer care in Ireland. All the webinars are available at the uh, RCSI School of Population Health uh, website if you want to see them. This year, we have called the webinar series Chronic Diseases in Ireland, How to Achieve Better Outcomes. A recent OECD report has shown that more than a third of adults in the OECD countries are living with long-standing illnesses or health problems, including cardiovascular disease, cancer, respiratory disease, and diabetes. Chronic diseases are challenging for both the individuals and their families, the health and social care sector, and the wider society. Chronic diseases have impact on both earlier death and poor health-related quality of life, and they require a large part of the available health care resources. Chronic diseases also have wider negative implications on individuals' ability to take active part in employment and social life. A large proportion of chronic diseases and their negative health impacts may be preventable, for example, by lifestyle lifestyle changes related to tobacco, alcohol, diet, physical activity, and better adherence to a range of available preventive strategies. Epidemiological data suggests that the burden of chronic diseases is unequally distributed among social groups. For many chronic diseases, the prevalence is higher in social disadvantaged groups, and these groups may also experience worse consequences because they are, they are less likely to seek effective interventions and may experience poor outcome from such interventions. This webinar series will focus on the future for people with chronic diseases. It will explore, explore historic changes in the prevalence of chronic diseases, including the growth in numbers of those with more than one chronic condition. We will explore health and economic consequences of chronic diseases with a view to uh, understand how these might be addressed um, as well as their future challenges. We will discuss health consequences for patients and their families, as well as the demand for future health care services. Further, we will explore the challenges of addressing and measuring health outcomes including the impact on life expectancy, quality of life, and the cost of caring for people with chronic diseases. Invited experts will offer their perspective on the use of health economic approaches to support better outcomes for patients, the health service, and society. Today, we have invited three speakers who will share their take on the theme. I will take this opportunity to thank uh, the speakers for their time and their willingness to take part in this webinar. I will also thank the organizing group uh, that consists of David Don and Fergus Sharp from Janssen Pharmaceuticals, Bridget Cunningham from Novartis, Patricia Carney from University College Cork, Ronan Glynn from EY Ireland, and my colleagues Brian Lynch, Laura Hammond, and Kathleen Bennett from the School of Population Health. I also want to appreciate the or acknowledge the companies for their financial support of this webinar series. We are very grateful to Ronan Glenn, the sector lead from EY uh, Ireland. Um, Ronan, has, uh, Ronan was the deputy chief medical officer at the Department of Health and has also agreed to be moderator of our webinar uh, this year. We appreciate uh, you taking this role on, uh, Ronan, as a moderator for this webinar. Before I hand over to Ronan, I just want to take the opportunity to thank all the participants for taking part in this uh, webinar. We are pleased to see so many um, with a large interest in the webinar. I also want to remind you that the next Healthcare Outcome Conference 
is taking place in RCSI on Tuesday, the 16th of April. The theme is improving health outcomes through uh, AI, artificial intelligence. You can see more information about this conference on the RCSI webpage. We hope to see you there. After all these opening comments, I now hand over to our moderator, Ronan Glenn. Ronan, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jan. Uh, and good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to, to the webinar. Uh, it's great to be back for the third year of this webinar series. And obviously, as Jan said, this year we're going to focus on health outcomes for those living with, with chronic disease. Um, today, we're going to discuss the epidemiology of chronic disease in Ireland. We're going to look at the, the, the impact of health policy on outcomes for people living with chronic disease. And then we're also going to, importantly, get a patient perspective. Um, just some housekeeping before I introduce the, the speakers. So we're, we're going to have three speakers. Uh, each will speak for approximately 20 minutes, uh, and that will leave us some time for, for Q&A. So if, if, if anyone in the audience has questions that they want to ask our speakers, please pop them into the, 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 the chat uh, and we will get to as many as we can. Uh, we'll aim to finish uh, the, the webinar by 1.30 sharp. Uh, so I might move then to just introduce our first speaker today, who's Professor Patricia Carney. Uh, Professor Carney obtained a medical degree from UCC before completing training in internal medicine in Ireland and the US. And she was awarded a Fulbright scholarship to undertake an MPH in Tulane, and she subsequently completed a PhD in public health. In 2003, she was awarded a Wellcome Trust Cardiovascular Research Junior Research Fellowship uh, to work as a research fellow at the University of Oxford. In 2008, she was appointed as a senior lecturer in public health at UCC, and her research interests are in primary and secondary prevention of traditional risk factors for cardiovascular disease, life course epidemiology and clinical trials. She leads a HRB funded interdisciplinary capacity enhancement award that is utilising data from nine Irish observational studies to look at lifestyle transitions across the life, life course. Patricia is also a member of the National Steering Committee for TILDA and chairs the Cardiovascular Working Group. Patricia. Thanks, Ronan. Uh, good afternoon and uh, thanks uh, Rowan for moderating and thanks uh, to RCSI for the kind invitation to speak to you this afternoon about chronic disease. Um, so I thought given the week that's in it, um, I was looking through some images and found uh, this one with uh, lovely green and uh, Professor Paul Welton is in the image there next to me who's been a, a mentor uh, throughout my career and he's um, a leading figure in, in cardiovascular epidemiology. And this image was taken over 20 years ago now and when I uh, graduated with a master's in public health from Tulane University and the, my dissertation work there for my master's was around the global burden of hypertension and that for me is where my, my chronic disease story really started and the work that I led was assembling data from uh, studies from all over the world that reported on the prevalence of hypertension and I was particularly disappointed that when I was looking at um, the established market economies, so the countries that Ireland would be a member of, and um, that there was no national Irish data to include in this piece of work. Um, sorry, and Patricia, we can't see yeah. your slides, sorry. Oh, apologies. Uh, and by the sounds of things, we'd love to. <laughs> um, oh worked earlier. Uh, there we go. Is that working now? Fantastic, yeah. thank you. Great, so apologies about that. I'll uh, run through the, so this is the image that I was just speaking to there. Um, so the this work, The Global Burden of Hypertension, was published in The Lancet um, a little over 20 years ago now, and it formed the, the research component of my master's in public health. And as I mentioned, uh, there was no Irish data to include at that time. We did not have any national prevalence data. And so for public health policymakers, uh, um, planners um, around prioritisation, national service plan, the data that was used for there tended to be data from the UK that was then uh, applied to the Irish population distribution. Um, so it, it piqued my interest as an epidemiologist and someone who likes to work with data. So fast forwarding and I found another green image 
Um, this is from a couple of years ago when I became a member of the Royal Irish Academy. Um, and in the intervening 20 years, I've had the privilege of working on a number of large data sets. Um, particularly, I was involved at the very outset of the Irish Longitudinal Study of Aging and had the opportunity to work there with Professor Roseanne Kenny and her team, um, as well as more regional data um, in Cork, the Mitchellstown Cohort Study. I've also worked on data from, from Healthy Ireland um, and the work that I have done has a contribution in a small way to the development of the Chronic Disease Management Programme. And so I thought for the rest of the time, uh, I would speak a little bit to how I interrogate the data um, and that, that, that then gets to be used um, by, by, by the people making the policy decisions. So I think there's over 100 people, maybe more, who've, who've dialed in. So the, the fact that you're here speaks to the interest in chronic disease um, we are familiar with increasing rates. I'm going to focus primarily on chronic disease relating to cardiovascular disease, diabetes and hypertension, but would like to acknowledge, of course, that cancer is really now a chronic disease and, and, and an, an important one to consider. One of the things that has happened um, is that there's been a huge amount of change nationally, and I'm sure you're aware of that in terms of thinking about the infrastructure that has come about through Healthy Ireland to focus on prevention um, I already mentioned the Integrated Care Programme for the Prevention and Management of Chronic Disease, which really has been a, a game changer. And I think in future seminars, um, there's going to be an even greater focus on that. And um, there's the framework for self-management to support of chronic conditions and with Sloan to Care, a whole implementation strategy, which is really changing the way that our services are providing supports for chronic disease prevention. What I wanted to focus on is really how and what data were used to help inform some of those decisions. Looking at it from a global perspective, and this is a link to the um, Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation. You can go into this website, put in any country and find this information. And what you will see here, and this is specifically to, to Ireland and why we want, need to focus on, on chronic disease prevention is, I'm sure not surprisingly to many of you, the, the top causes of death in Ireland are similar to those in many other places. So things like ischemic heart disease and stroke. What's important to think about is not just death, but also disability. So thinking about morbidity and what happens when we combine um, the, the conditions that cause disability with those that cause death. And then most importantly, and thinking about it from a public health perspective and the cause of the causes, looking at the risk factors that are driving death and disability. And what's of interest here is that there are these factors, things like uh, cigarette smoking, high blood pressure, which is a particular interest of mine, high BMI, diet, high plasma glucose, alcohol use. These are potentially modifiable factors and we need to think about how we can change um, the structures and systems to support uh, uh, improving those risk factors in our society. So this is a summary really of the work that I'm going to go through now in a bit more detail and the high line headline figure. So depending, I'm guessing that everyone who's dialed in is between 18 and 75, but perhaps we have some uh, enthusiastic transition year students maybe, maybe tuning in as well who might be a bit younger, but really no matter where you fall, to be of relevance to you um, uh, and it, it increases in frequency in terms of the prevalence or burden as we age. So looking then, and I'm focused here specifically on the eight chronic conditions that have been prioritised by the Chronic Disease Management Programme. These data are were, were produced by me and my research team in collaboration with the um, Chronic Disease Management Programme. At the time, there was a need when the programme was being planned to uh, assess what proportion of the population were likely to be in Ireland who were having these conditions and, and also provide counts around that so that from a service planning perspective there would be the information available uh, in terms of the, the, the service need. The, the eight con conditions here um, are asthma, COPD, chronic heart disease, stroke, diabetes, heart failure, TIA is transient ischemic attack or a, a mini stroke and atrial fibrillation. Asthma is the one that uh, is a little bit different in terms of how it, it behaves or presents. And you can see here that the prevalence is pretty similar um, across the different age ranges. For all of the other conditions, you see this very clear age gradient 
where the prevalence of the individual condition increases in the higher age groups. And the other thing that I, I wanted to mention here was that the, these estimates were all um, generated using data from TILDA, the Irish Longitudinal Study of Aging. I know that Jan mentioned in his introduction the importance of multimorbidity and the reality that many people are living with many of these conditions in combination. And so in the lower part of the table, what you see there is what happens when you combine the different conditions together and the prevalence so that you see um, you know, nearly a third uh, in the highest age group have at least one condition um, and then smaller proportions having at least two or at least three conditions. And this again is important from a health service perspective in thinking about how we structure the way the care is delivered um, and, and reach people with different numbers of conditions. So this essentially summarizes that information in tabular format. You can see there in the light blue, the asthma, which uh, as I mentioned, is a little bit different from the other conditions which have this very clear age gradient so that the prevalence increases in age and that's relevant if you think about things like the chronic disease management program and the way that that was rolled out it started with the oldest age group in whom there was the highest need looking then at it from a gender perspective and um, i think it's always helpful to see if there are any patterns and um, when we look at, at, at prevalence estimates by gender and we can see um, that there are, uh, as we might expect, uh, higher prevalence in particular uh, of chronic heart disease in men than in women and also in, in, in diabetes. Um, so moving on then, and again, I mentioned this about the, the impact of disadvantage. And um, so this is looking at the eight conditions, so very similar to the previous table. So each of the individual eight conditions in the first higher part of the table and then the lower part of the table, you see the combination, so the, the impact of multimorbidity. But here, rather than looking at age group, we're looking at it by deprivation level, and this is using the HP Pubble Deprivation Index. This is important because one of the things that we can see um, in Ireland and in many countries is that there has, in fact, been um, an improvement in, in, in many measures of, of health um, over the past number of years. And we see an improvement in some things like um, uh, blood pressure, for example, or blood pressure control. Um, and when we look at this as an average effect, it might look like that things are really improving. But when we drill down into the data in a bit more detail, what we see is that while overall there may be a, a, a flattening or a potential improvement in management of, of risk factors for chronic disease, what we see is that the gap between the most advantaged and most disadvantaged in our society is actually widening. And, and so there's a real need to focus in particular among the more disadvantaged in society. When we look here, and I've just used the, the, the red there to um, uh, highlight the extremes. So if you see there for chronic heart disease, coronary heart disease, um, in the most affluent um, in the deprivation index, um, you can see that it's, it's less than half um, that of the most uh, disadvantaged. Um, and we see a similar pattern. Uh, so for diabetes, it's actually three times um, uh, as high the prevalence in the most disadvantaged compared to the uh, more affluent in our society. So a real, um, uh, I suppose, going back to the, the, the value of having the data. So this is Irish data demonstrating very clearly um, the uh, disparities and the inequities that exist, that exist. So there are inequalities, they're unjust and they're preventable. Um, so these are health inequities that we need to think about how our service is structured to, to address these. I thought it might be helpful to just briefly um, uh, provide a description of the, the, the deprivation index. Um, and so there's information here that people will be able to follow up on afterwards and the, the methods that are used in terms of using sources of data again to actually come up with a, an area level of, of deprivation. So I must admit that uh, ordinarily and 
primarily because of the data that is available to us. Um, a lot of the time we use more crude measures. So rather than looking, for example, as the deprivation index does in um, quite a granular way, looking across the different deciles of disadvantage, we often look in a more crude way and uh, uh, very readily available and often in health data sets, uh, GMS status is, is, is usually available and is a useful way uh, to categorize um, and so we see here again the eight chronic conditions that have been prioritized by the chronic disease management program um, and we look at their distribution overall in the population and then stratified by GMS and non-GMS. What we can see here is we do see a higher uh, prevalence of uh, the, the conditions in the GMS than in the non-GMS um, at first glance, this doesn't look um, like that it's that uh, remarkable and um, the, the higher prevalence in the GMS than the non-GMS. But of course, one of the things that we need to consider, and this is the truth for, for any data, um, you know, is are, are we making appropriate comparisons here or are we comparing apples and oranges? So one of the things that we know about the GMS is and um, so this is the, the medical card or GP visit card. Uh, we know that there is an age um, uh, category in terms of the, the 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 eligibility is different depending on your age. And so most people in Ireland 65 and over would meet the uh, eligibility criteria for the GMS. And as we've already seen, age is a very powerful predictor of chronic disease prevalence. Um, and so it would be, these are crude uh, prevalence estimates, they're not. Uh, so they are in the 18 to 44 year age group, but they're across the whole age group. So they, we haven't, for example, divided into five year age groups and done more, um, uh, uh, done age adjustment. So what you see here then in this older age group, um, uh, what we might expect um, the, the, in the GMS group, and we can see this much higher um, prevalence um, of, the, of the chronic conditions. Um, and if we look down here at multimorbidity, so um, in the GMS population, you see this huge burden of multimorbidity. Um, and then this is looking at the same data, but in this time providing it in a, in a, in a figure schematic. So in the younger age group, um, looking at any of the conditions, looking at each, of the individual conditions um, and then looking at them in, in combination. This is for the 18 to 44 year age group. Um, oh, and I must have missed putting in apologies, the, the older age group. So this in, information is, is, is really helpful for, for policy users. And um, one of the grants that I was uh, successfully awarded was one in collaboration with um, the, uh, with the number of knowledge users, Dr. O'Reilly, Dr. Sarah O'Brien, um, and they were able to use this information when they were planning the chronic disease management program and the chronic disease treatment program. They were able to apply the prevalence estimates. We also provide data from the CSO to actually provide counts of the number of people who would we would expect would be found once these programs were rolled out um, and, and treatment and prevention um, was, was initiated for them. And why is this helpful? Well, I thought the other thing that would be would be good to present to you is some, some other work that we did also using TILDA data um, and looking to, to show how the case could be made for investing in prevention. Um, and uh, intervening earlier in the disease pathway from a purely health economic perspective. So we're looking here, uh, as I mentioned, using uh, TILDA data. So people in TILDA were asked a question about uh, whether or not they had a history of cardiovascular disease, whether they had a doctor diagnosis of a heart attack, stroke, um, and we categorised them into having cardiovascular disease or not. And then they were asked a number of questions about their health service utilization in the year prior to their attendance at the TILDA visit. Um, and so what we he see here uh, are the average number of GP visits for people with and without cardiovascular disease, as well as overall, the percentage of people who actually attended 
the GP. So, of course, um, in terms of the population is aged 50 years and over, we see a very high proportion of people attended the GP in the past um, in the past year and a higher number of visits for those with cardiovascular disease history than those without. Looking then at the, sure. thank you, and uh, looking at A&E attendance, um, much uh, smaller uh, proportion of people attending the A&E, and um, with a smaller number, less than average, less than average of one, uh, in fact, less than a, a half a visit. And um, looking at OPD, again, uh, higher proportions, but really small numbers, and then uh, for uh, hospital admission. Um, and then you can see that we costed these. We costed these per person. And what I will just highlight to you here is that, that the, as we might expect, are much higher than the cost of the GP. So, together and makes the point. So, while there are much more GP visits, because hospital visits cost and hospital admissions cost much more. This uh, graph is summarizing a lot of different information. So you have the estimates for women and men separately um, in the different colors, and then you have the different type of visits, so GP, OPD, a &E, hospital, and overall. And I think just looking at that schematic, you can see that it's the hospital cost which is driving a lot of the total cost. Um, and so we did a similar analysis where instead of looking separately by gender, we looked separately by age group. You can see the same pattern for each of the different age groups. It's this hospital um, uh, cost, which is driving a huge proportion of the overall cost. And why is that important? Um, but some of these costs are preventable and they're preventable if we intervene earlier in our chronic disease management and provide better treatment and support. And actually putting numbers in terms of the millions um, can be very useful from a health service prioritisation and planning perspective. The work that I've described here, the heavy lifting was done by two postdocs who were um, supported by the HRB grant, the Secondary Data Analysis Project EPIC, um, Danko and Kate. Uh, they've both now gone, gone on to other roles and there were a lot of other uh, co-PIs involved in UCC as well as the HSC collaborators. Um, I've mentioned Orla and Sarah and also Claire Buckley and, and Paul Kavanagh um, from Health Intelligence. So then I just wanted to mention very brief, briefly um, I started with um, how it started, uh, how it's going, and 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 I thought it would be nice to end with the future. And um, so over the past number of years, I've co-led with Professor Molly Bird in Galway a collaborative doctoral program in chronic disease prevention, and we've had the privilege of training six fantastic uh, PhD students who are all now in their final year and have all. Uh, led projects looking at different aspects of chronic disease prevention and I hope they will be the people speaking in the future about how we go forward with chronic disease prevention. So thank you. It's fantastic Patricia, thank you and great to see uh, those PhD students coming through. Um, so we, we'll come to questions maybe at the end, if that's OK. Uh, and, and now we move to our next speaker, who's Professor Ed Gregg. So Professor Gregg is head of the RCSI School of Population Health. Uh, prior to arriving at the RCSI, he served as a professor and chair in diabetes and cardiovascular disease epidemiology at the School of Public Health at Imperial College London. And before that, he led multidisciplinary public health research on chronic diseases uh, at the US Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Ed has worked extensively in chronic disease epidemiology and surveillance, prevention effectiveness trials, <clears throat> and the development of natural experiments to study health policy. He's led and served in numerous health policy development roles for diabetes and chronic diseases for organizations, including WHO, the Lancet Commission, the US CDC, and the American Diabetes Association. Uh, Ed was awarded the 88 2016 Kelly West Award for Excellence in Diabetes Epidemiology, and the International Diabetes Federation 2015 Award uh, for Epidemiology. So Ed, I'll hand over to yourself. Thank you. Thank you, Ronan. Um, can you hear me OK? And let me just make sure I can share my slides correctly. So 
thank you for that kind introduction there, Ronan. And I'd like to thank everybody for attending this and, and being part of this discussion. Um, are you seeing my slides there, Ronan? We're seeing them, but not on full screen just OK. Yet. There we go. Um, Perfect. So, OK, great. So um, thank you again and I'd like to thank Patricia Kearney for a, a great overview and basically setting the landscape um, of the problem for us in Ireland. I think my job is to transition to from the problem to ideally the solution. I can't guarantee uh, to have the answers, but I at least want to want to raise what I think what some of the priorities could be. Uh, should be. I'd like to start by just adding a, a, a bit as well that when we think about that spectrum of problems that that Patricia described, that there are a number of attributes that actually in that we may learn from. In some cases, though, they complicate our job. And and one is that one of the reasons that we see this this problem is actually a good thing is we have increasing survival with and without chronic conditions. So th this ends up being a real predicament when one of the main things that we're trying to achieve, which is longer lifespans, is actually increasing uh, one of our major problems. Um, and so with a lot of conditions, what we see then is we see actually persistent prevalence, even if we're having success in reducing cases. So, you know, that would be true for diabetes and cardiovascular disease, where even if we're actually reducing incidence, prevalence is still, or the proportion with the problem is still flat or even growing, basically because of, of that survival. Um, some of the other um, sort of aggravating factors here is that we have, or what makes it difficult is a lot of these conditions develop over decades. So when our interventions to try to prevent and intervene are focused on um, acting when we see them, we don't necessarily have such good science about how to act the, the, the decade or two before when the condition was developing. And we see now how early onset obesity and diabetes are examples of sort of key drivers for us. And, and finally, I think the result of these attributes is, is something that um, Patricia referred to, and that's this growth of multimorbidity or multiple long-term conditions. That's really one of our, our upcoming challenges. I also add that, let me see if I can progress slide here. Um, you know, when we look at the diversity of problems, we see that they play out in different ways. And I think this ends up being informative for us, but um, it's, it's really fascinating to see that some problems are just seem to consistently grow and seemingly are intractable, our problems of obesity and type two diabetes and inequalities. Others we see they rise dramatically and they have what seem like remarkable wins with you know hepatitis C or um, um, HIV, for example, is now a, a considered a chronic condition really. Um, others have success over decades, but then after you see success, you see they stagnate. And then others, you see this surreptitious and they become evident, such as in the US and uh, perhaps Ireland as well, the problem of opioid abuse, which we don't think of as chronic conditions, but they really have their roots in chronic conditions as well. And um, we also have to think about the way that injuries um, overlap and with our chronic conditions as well. So um, really the etiology and the sources are quite diverse. And you know, if you go and you look at the problem, and this is actually borrowing from a similar data source that Patricia referred to. This is the old burden of disease, which is not the, the most precise or best way to look within a single country, but it is informative. And that what you see here is really the overwhelming diversity of conditions that we deal with when you take a population perspective. And, you know, the health system and clinicians, of course, have to deal with all of these uh, along the way. But when we think about, okay, what's our challenge in, in population health and what's our approach, then this is quite overwhelming. Um, so what I'd like to transition to now is really how we tackle this problem of such diversity um, systematically and ask the question, what should a population-based prevention approach look like? And I'll propose really three to four tenants here. First of all, one thing that we're doing, one of the essences, is that we're looking for efficient conduits or risk factors of common or multiple conditions. So we can kill lots of birds with one stone. Um, Patricia referred to this as well, but this is why, for example, these issues of things like high blood pressure, smoking, high plasma glucose, high body mass index, actually rise to the list as risk factors that dominate disability and death. And it's because they have this deadly combo of affecting large segments of the population 
while also having a high relative risk for key, their key conditions that result, these you know, common killers, common cause of disability. And at the same time, um, they also are um, highly modifiable. And with that, um, these end up being our targets potentially or ways that we can, we can potentially influence large segments um, of the problem. Now, the second, I think, key aspect of a population-based approach is that we're looking for synergistic interventions to efficiently impact multiple outcomes. So when we think about that breadth, that diversity of conditions, how can we find interventions that affect more than one at a time? Okay. Um, now, one example would be physical activity. And I think of this as a classic, wherein we can think of dozens of positive health effects, and we see how uh, a physically active lifestyle, if somebody's able to maintain one for an entire lifetime, it affects so much of quality of life along the way. And we could we also see how it perhaps has different um, the, the, the it's proportional, its contribution to different benefits varies over the life course. Early in life, it might be lifestyle forming and habituation. Later, it might become in, in terms of um, helping to maintain healthy body weight. Later in middle age, it might be that it's diabetes and then cardiovascular disease. And then it becomes arguably more important really for physical function and falls and fractures or even dementia and, and brain health. So this would be an example of a synergistic uh, intervention if we can find a, a way to act on it. Um, perhaps, you know, one of the most um, single powerful examples is actually lowering blood pressure because this by itself, um, again, affects large segments of the population at the same time um, affects lots of conditions and also has a high relative risk. So we see that if we can lower blood pressure, we can have an enormous effect, um, really a disproportionate effect on, on overall health. So the third really tenant, I think that we, we, when we take a population approach to this problem of chronic disease, we're looking for diverse multi-tiered avenues of action, and we're pairing population-wide with individual targeted approaches. So the idea here is that the players ultimately in prevention are really diverse. It's not just the doctor and the health system, although that's crucial. It's also community organizations, it's um, the way we communicate with the public, it's our policies, it's our environment. And so we have to, we want to think ideally about the way we um, develop interventions across all four of these domains. And when you look at really the big successes along the way, and we often point to the reduction in cardiovascular disease mortality and incidence as, as one of the big successes, you really see how that really was the result of multiple factors this uh, slide on the right here, slide on the left is, is showing that reduction over time um, in cardiovascular disease and mortality. The slide on the right though is showing, um, you know, well-referenced um, classics modeling study that estimates how different aspects of primary care, of risk factor management, of policies affecting uh, tobacco, of policies affecting access to care, of behavior and um, approaches, and and um, and then life extending medical care as well, all really were um, factors influencing that. And in the meantime, those were able to offset the fact that we had growth of, of um, obesity and diabetes in the background, um, trying to, uh, um, working to try to keep this, uh, these, these rates higher. So, let me see here, moving ahead. So, where does this take us? What are the approaches that then we can consider taking and and um, I'm going to share what I propose is four priority problems to solve for us to progress with these chronic conditions. They're certainly not the only four, but they're they're the four that really uh, came to the forefront of my mind this week anyway. Um, the first is reducing the steep cascade of care. OK, and I raise this because this is a fairly ubiquitous problem and challenge that cuts across lots of conditions. If you look at the success in HIV, um, the idea of quantifying a cascade of care became one of the central ways of monitoring success and also motivating action for the problem, okay? And what was simply done was surveillance data was used to quantify uh, the people living with HIV who knew their status to target uh, screening and detection, and then 
the next step would be the people living with HIV on treatment to motivate uh, treatment among those um, that have been identified. And then finally, um, those who were uh, virally suppressed. Well, following that model, we can apply the same thing to diabetes, uh, hypertension, other chronic cancer care, other chronic conditions that's used uh, a lot now. And this is a slide on the right where we quantified in the US and showed how, unfortunately, um, when you start with the, well, in the US, 20 million or so who had diabetes at that point in time, you can see that if you then look at the proportions of them that have a usual place of care, um, meet with a provider regularly or non-smokers, and then meet each of the sequential um, targets, high priority targets, that you have this staircase really stepping downwards. So the real the goal here is, is to actually flatten it and have this be flat across. And what this is a reflection of, I think, is that with diabetes and many other chronic conditions, whereas we always have the need for new discovery of new treatments, new approaches, new prevention, at the same time, they're defined equally by the failure to implement what we already know works. And diabetes, for example, has no shortage of effective interventions. This is a, a systematic review of cost effectiveness. And if you look, um, essentially, if, if you're over on the left side of this screen, if the, the diamond, it's, it's a cost savings intervention. But if you're in that, that second segment between zero and fifty. Um, uh, thousand dollars per quality. These are highly cost effective interventions and you can see the number of interventions that primarily reside in primary care or based on self management or um, risk factor management that can be provided out of primary care. There's many, many things that can be applied uh, or, or given and they're just simply not. Um, so really, how do we get this? Well, um, there are probably a number of ways, but I think a lot of this actually returns to the chronic care model. This um, figure on the left is, is a representation of it that, you know, when Ed Wagner, um, who developed this, I suppose it's more than 30 years ago now, um, and the idea of a working learning health system that provides good self-management support, decision support, um, uh, delivery system design, and clinical information systems to guide and monitor and improve care uh, on an ongoing basis, all um, closely connected communities. When this was conceived of at that time, the, the evidence for the whole package actually was not so strong, but um, over time, this really, I think, um, the, the evidence really bore out well and has shown actually now um, to have a, an amazing legacy. Now, it's taken on different flavors and it's grown and developed, and now we see, I think this is sort of co core concepts in um, the HSC's National Framework for Integrated Prevention and Management of Chronic Disease, as well as an NHS and other health systems. But now we see that when we go and we look at the evidence and the science for the, the basic components of the chronic care model that in turn can influence that cascade of care, we see how all the elements um, or most of these elements of chronic care. This is a systematic review on how well they work for people with diabetes. And you can see how much, how consistently we see that each of these um, elements of chronic care help to reduce um, risk factor levels. And when you put them together, they have a particularly powerful effect. So that's the first priority. I think the second priority is finding the formula to change lifestyle behaviors. I referred to this a bit before. You know, if you look and you take studies, uh, randomized clinical trials looking at hard outcomes, we actually now have evidence that the combination of physical activity, dietary change to maintain healthy weight really affects a number of outcomes. Perhaps the biggest effect is seen for diabetes, where you can see a 50 percent reduction in, in incidence or more. But you see effects for hypertension, for disability, for chronic kidney disease, cardiovascular disease incidence uh, is um, perhaps ironically has a slightly smaller moderate um, magnitude of effect, but nevertheless, you see this benefit across multiple conditions. Now, what this evidence um, then leads to often is unfortunately the debate between um, the classic population and high risk approaches to prevention. And the notion here, Jeffrey Rose is a famous epidemiologist, um, showed and made the point that if you can shift 
the risk distribution of an entire population, and that's what the slide on the right is intended to show, then really what you do is by definition, you're, you're reducing incidence of people above that threshold that we call disease, while at the same time, and, and you're actually doing it to a greater extent, while at the same time lowering the risk of the whole population and reducing their subsequent risk as well. And this was kind of argued as, as um, uh, preferable or, or um, really any, a key complement to what was the classic, more clinically oriented approach, the high risk approach that would uh, aims to find people above the threshold and then just act upon them. Um, unfortunately, I think that this theory sort of um, was drawn in as, as being in, in opposition to, but in reality, when we talk about a population health approach, we're really wanting to employ both because depending on the condition, um, the, the um, a whole population approach versus a high risk approach might have different levels of effectiveness. In most cases, though, we're trying to put these together. And when we look at this problem of lifestyle change, we can see how this works. Um, if you go across the, the Irish Sea, you see the NHS is actually arguably the most provocative, I think, of health systems I've seen in terms of actually trying to provide lifestyle support across different tiers of risk. They have things such as the National Diabetes Prevention Program, now in a, a digital obesity program, um, different tailored programs of all sorts. Now, these would be considered classic high risk approaches, individually targeted approaches that look for people above a certain risk threshold and give them a lot of attention. OK, so this would be one approach. Now. A complementary approach might aim more at the middle aspect of the distribution and recognize that we all carry or most of us do carry a risk factor of some sort, um, whether it's genetic and or lifestyle, and that if we can actually educate ourselves, have community supports and perhaps health system support to make changes, then um, we can all lower that risk in the middle part of the distribution. And then at the other end, the idea of actually changing policies to influence lifestyle um, in ways that we may not even realize are occurring to us, um, things such as the taxes on the unhealthy foods that we eat, or the incentives that give us access to healthier foods, or the changes in our environment or our neighborhoods that make it easier to be physically active. These would all be considered population level approaches. And I think what we need to really recognize is that for us to make a big difference, for us to really change the curve on things like diabetes, um, on multiple long-term conditions, on obesity, that we actually need these working in tandem. So I, I um, you know, think of it as a little bit as a multi-tiered table like this, wherein segments of the population should be actually um, given particular attention when it's effective and cost effective, but we need to complement that with a broad menu of approaches for the entire population. So 15 minutes, Ed. OK, thank you. Um, and then the third priority is that we need to find a way of mitigating the effects of social determinants of health. Um, when I talked at the very beginning about the conduits um, that affect lots of outcomes, this is perhaps the biggest of all and the most difficult. We see this cutting across uh, virtually all of health. Um, and the reasons why people being um, having a uh, seven to 10 year shorter lifespan or a seven to 10 year earlier onset of disability if you're in the least deprived neighborhoods versus the highest deprived neighborhoods um, is due to many, many factors. It actually has um, a huge effect and, and particularly notable effect in cardiovascular disease. Now, cracking this nut is a tough one. Um, because we don't, it probably requires the classic population approaches in that you need really a full court press, all elements working. And it's very hard to point to the evidence that tells us which one of these multiple aspects that we act on, whether we act on um, sociopolitical and economic aspects, social factors, um, the environment, whether we act to change access to care, whether we the we tailor the interventions better, um, whether we work through big business, you could argue we need all of this working in tandem to make a difference. But really, this is 
probably our biggest challenge of the day for uh, chronic diseases. Um, and then the last thing I would mention, I think, is really an opportunity, and that's that the world has changed dramatically in the last um, in the last decade, and it's affected the science and the way we can make decisions. Um, the sources of data that we have, the real world data, um, to inform the way that risks are changing and the way that the that the actual approaches that we use, both in and out of healthcare, to change those risks work and don't work, um, is enormous. And so we've seen a growth of new disciplines in population health science, um, multi-omics to really understand mechanisms better, natural experiments and comparative effectiveness to, to understand real world effectiveness. Um, we have growth in interest in, in developing personalized medicine as well as population wide implementation research. So I think we need all of these involved to, to help answer those, some of those, unca those unanswered questions that I've raised. So a um, bit of a whirlwind here. I hope this all made some sense to you. I'd like to just try to summarize the, the, the whole 20 minutes and say chronic conditions, of course, present an enormous challenge for us because of their diversity, um, the impact of declining mortality, they're, they're changing character, and particularly their roots and social factors. The essence of our population health approach, again, is to find efficient targets for intervention and then also synergistic interventions. And I'm proposing here at least four priorities. There are many more, but we want to tackle this steep cascade of care of chronic conditions. We want to achieve lasting behavior change through multifaceted avenues. We want to mitigate the effects of social determinants of health, and we want to exploit these new areas of science for effective decision making. So um, thank you. I hope I'm within time, and I'll hand it back to Ronan. And I guess I need to stop sharing somehow. Let's see here. There we go. Fantastic, Ed. Thank you. Uh, and as I say, we'll come back to questions at the end. Uh, but now we'll move to our final speaker today, who's Fiona Barden. Fiona had a stroke in August 2019 at the age of 33, uh, just days before she was due to move from Ireland to start a new teaching job in Dubai. Fiona has presented to the Oireachtas Committee on Disability Matters about the difficulties of living as a stroke survivor, and the lack of services for patients in Ireland following discharge from hospital. Fiona is a patient representative on the Community Paramedic Standards Development Committee. She also represents young stroke survivors in Ireland on the Irish Heart Foundation Stroke Patient Panel, and she's involved in the co-designing Life After Stroke Pathway Programme. She graduated as a patient champion for the Irish Heart Foundation in 2023. She recently won the Patient Advocacy Volunteer Supporting Stroke Award, as well as overall volunteer supporting stroke award at the Irish Heart Foundation's National Volunteer Conference in November. In sharing her story, Fiona hopes to provide support for other stroke survivors, as well as raise awareness among medical professionals and the general public of the hidden difficulties stroke survivors face daily. Fiona. Thank you. Um, I am just going to share my screen now. So hopefully this goes without a glitch. Um, okay, is that me now? Perfect. Super, thank you. Perfect. So thank you for that. Um, so I am going to be talking about chronic disease from a patient perspective, and I just want to thank the RCSI for inviting me to speak here today. So on the morning um, uh, in August 2019, I woke up feeling sick. I put on a rush and I returned to bed and I just texted a friend to cancel lunch because I wasn't feeling up to it. My text didn't make sense, but I didn't think anything of it. I just really wanted to go back to sleep. I temporarily moved back in with my mum because I was supposed to be moving to, to Dubai that week. In that afternoon, my mum came home and she found me vomiting and as all good Irish mothers do she went out to the shop to buy some seven up and flattened it for me but that didn't work unfortunately and um, later that evening she said that she heard a funny noise coming from the sitting room where I was and she came in to find me on the floor having a seizure she rang 999 and there was no ambulance available so the fire brigade came and then the ambulance came after that and the only thing I remember about that is that there was someone standing close to me asking me questions but I wasn't able to understand anything that was being said to me and eventually I just heard him say mum and I could sense that she was near me so I was able to indicate that I knew she was there but that was it 
and they then brought me to hospital, thankfully. So my stroke symptoms were vomiting, seizure, blurred or no vision, and I was able to answer questions unable to answer questions or speak coherently. And I wanted to put a slide in specifically here on this because I think we're also aware of the fast symptoms, the face, the arms, the speech, and then it's time to ring 999. But not everybody experiences all of these symptoms. That And if they do, it may only do, be displayed for a few seconds. So if there's not somebody with you when your face droops, then that might be picked up. I think it's also remember that it's important to remember that stroke doesn't affect just older people. Nearly a quarter of all stroke survivors are people under the age of 65. And I still do get comments from the general public and medical professionals saying, oh, but you're so young. Uh, so I think it's really important to keep that in mind. I attended a conference earlier this week and it was mentioned that women may also describe or experience different symptoms. So it's important to be mindful of this as well. And from talking to my other stroke survivor colleagues, I've realised that we're not all necessarily experiencing the generic fast symptoms. Instead, we have symptoms such as vomiting, seizure, blurred vision, difficulty with comprehension, which is different from slurred speech, dizziness, um, headaches or migraines and balance or coordination issues and just overall a feeling that something's not quite right. So just um, I think it's important to remember this if patients are presenting to emergency departments. I know that often some of these can be linked to the consumption of drugs or alcohol, but if we're not seen as possibly being a potential candidate for having a stroke, then the early and life saving interventions may not be put in place on time for us. So in hospital, the doctors, nurses, ancillary staff and consultants provided amazing care for me and my support was excellent. I was incredibly lucky that Professor Harbison was a consultant on duty that night when I went in and I went, um, I had CAT scans and CT scans and MRI scans and things like that. And it was discussed between my hospital and Beaumont to get second opinions and try to figure out what was wrong with me and what action to take. Um, so obviously one of the interventions was anti-seizure medication. Um, I had a team of experts who worked so well together to figure out what was wrong with me. After I think about three days, I woke up in ICU and there was a nurse feeding me uh, yogurt. And I remember her feeding me yogurt and me thinking, why is she feeding me and I'm not feeding myself? So I took the spoon off her to try and feed myself, not realizing that I couldn't actually grip the spoon and spilt the yogurt all down me, which I'm sure was frustrating for her because she had just uh, cleaned me. And it was only at that point that I realised that I was really in trouble. My hospital stay was quite a blur. I was really tired and confused. I couldn't speak properly and I didn't want anyone near me. And it was only when I uh, was showering and the nurses with me and I was trying to wash my hair, she noticed that I wasn't lifting both of my arms. So then, um, uh, uh, they organised for a uh, uh, x-ray to be done on my shoulder and it turned out I'd fractured my shoulder once I had fallen off the sofa during my seizure. I know that I was assessed by a speech and language therapist and an occupational therapist, but I have a very hazy memory of this. Uh, I did overhear a conversation that I may be back to work in about in a few weeks time, but it's now been over four years and I'm still not quite there yet. And before I was discharged, my mum insisted on speaking to an epilepsy nurse just so she could learn what to do if I did have another seizure. I naively thought that going home meant that I was better, but the reality was I went from being surrounded by medical professionals 24 seven to nothing. I was in a fog of confusion and I was hugely fatigued. Before leaving hospital, I didn't get to speak to a stroke nurse. I wasn't put on an early supported discharge plan and no public health nurse or social worker was assigned to help me. Issues first arose when I didn't realise that upon discharge, I only had one week's worth of medication and that I was supposed to have attended my GP to get a new prescription. I was no longer able to prepare simple meals. Things like making tea and toast for them to be ready at the same time was so difficult. I couldn't remember how to turn on my shower. I didn't know how to do simple tasks like tying my shoelaces. I was lucky to be under the care of lots of different consultants, but this also meant that there were mixed outcomes during my appointments. Some had queries regarding treatments or decisions that their colleagues had made. Some spoke at me rather than with me, and there was rarely any time for questions. I suppose this is an issue with time pressure in the HSE system that there's just so many patients and so few staff, and it can cause difficulties. 
as I had a stroke and a seizure, I obviously wasn't allowed to drive anymore for the year. So I had to arrange lifts to get to appointments. I had to navigate unknown corridors in different departments and try to remember how to complete different physio exercises. This was a hugely traumatic, life changing experience for me, and I wasn't given the opportunity to talk about it with a professional. To say I was lost is a complete understatement. My independence was gone. I had no energy and it was exhausting having visitors over to the house. My immediate family were fabulous, but I knew myself that I was always being minded because there was someone constantly with me. It turned out that they were right to be so worried and vigilant because when I was finally left alone for the first time, I accidentally set the microwave on fire. And then this was soon followed by me stepping out behind a reversing car as I'd forgotten the cars could move backwards. I felt as if my body had failed me and I was terrified that I would have another stroke. I had difficulty regulating my emotions and I had some issues with dexterity. When partaking in conversations, I would forget what I was talking about and I'd lose concentration. What I was thinking about in my head wasn't coming out of my mouth, but I couldn't correct it. I didn't trust my own brain and therefore how could I trust anybody else who was trying to help me? I also had huge guilt about what I'd put my family through, that they were so stressed. So I hid some difficulties from them as I didn't want to worry them even further. I had to try and find a, a balance between being independent and being comfortable with asking for help while I needed it. I was incredibly frustrated and felt incapable. I had to deal with insurance companies, discuss medical issues, apply for social welfare, and I was unable to read properly. I couldn't remember the meaning of simple words, but yet I had to fill in so many forms. I was also struggling with self-identity. I wasn't me anymore and I needed to figure out who I was and accept that this was a completely different life than what I had imagined for myself. Being a stroke survivor means I now have an invisible disability. As mentioned earlier, I fractured my shoulder. However, once that sling was removed a few weeks later, there was no visual reminder to people that there was still something wrong with me. And this is something I still find difficult to navigate as people often forget that I do have a brain injury, but I'm still expected to be as capable as I was before. Initially, I wasn't blatantly told I had a stroke and I'm not alone in this because when medical staff were speaking to me or my family, they were using acronyms such as CVA or ABM or other medical terminologies. And it was assumed that we realised that a clot meant a stroke, but we didn't know this. It was during a follow up appointment a few months later that the term stroke was used for the first time to me. And to be honest, it was a huge relief because this is something I actually understood and everything clicked into place then. Although I was referred to, for reha to rehab, I was at home in limbo for months on end with no intervention or support. In a medical appointment a few months after my stroke, I was told that they were going to take me off the referral list for the NRH. I clearly remember that appointment as I was handed sheets of paper that contained possible side effects that may occur post stroke. And it was announced to me that I was suffering from none of these without them ever asking my opinion on my own body and experience. They said I could look at the pages later, but this was have been but this was pointless as I couldn't read properly at that point in time and they didn't even know this. At no stage during this consultation was I asked to repeat what I'd been told and they didn't realise that I hadn't taken in the majority of what was said to me. Following this appointment, I had to urgently make a huge number of phone calls to ensure that I was seen before that letter arrived to the National Rehabilitation Hospital. It took me nearly six months to get my first rehab appointment and when I arrived there, my speech and language therapist was shocked that I hadn't been, I hadn't gotten there sooner. While it was a relief to get the support of speech and language therapy and occupational therapy, it was challenging due to COVID and then the HSE hacking. And I think it's better just to skip over both of those incidences now. I didn't know that there were other supports available outside of the HSE. When I finished in rehab, I was told that I should have already applied elsewhere, but this had not ever been mentioned to me before. I feel that it can be forgotten that as a patient, there is so much going on for us. The drive or ability to seek appropriate supports may be gone. We aren't fun functioning at full capacity and quite often we're also living with low mood too, but yet we're expected to just know what to do and to be proactive. For me, it's important to talk about the services and organisations that 
outside of the HSC that, that are provided to patients. As my experience is a stroke patient, it's the Irish Heart Foundation who have stepped in to provide the supports that we're not receiving from the HSC. The Irish Heart Foundation is a charity who only receives 7% of their income from state funding. They provide support for heart patients, stroke survivors, carers. They run public awareness campaigns such as the FAST campaign, anti-smoking, they highlight the negative effects of sugar intake, etc. They visit schools for activities like busy breaks and they do CPR training in secondary schools as well. And I feel it's very important to remind the government that without charities or organisations like the Irish Heart Foundation, the Irish Cancer Society, Irish Wheelchair Association, Alzheimer's Society of Ireland, Diabetes, just to name a few, Diabetes Ireland, that these organisations are plugging the gap in services and that there would be even more pressure placed on the HSC without them. I strongly believe that more awareness and funding should be given to these organisations when they are providing supports that we're not receiving from within the health care system. It took me 15 months to find the Irish Heart Foundation. Initially, I joined the Irish Heart Foundation's private Facebook page, and this led me then to joining a weekly online exercise class specifically for young stroke survivors. And this has now been extended to all stroke survivors across Ireland, regardless of age. As each class has an Irish Heart Foundation coordinator, we have built up relationships with them and they then can provide us information about what HSE supports may be available to us or in some cases don't exist so we can just stop looking for them. We also have access to a nurse phone line from Monday to Friday that we can call if we have any queries. They do have counselling service available if we want to avail of it and all new patients within that service now go through the Stroke Connect service, which is where there's a weekly phone call check-in. And then once that's, that's finished, they move to support groups. They also provide many excellent courses that we can avail of, such as mindfulness, art therapy, activate your life course, cognitive skill course, vocational therapy, etc. And they also do information talks on things like fatigue, heart failure, secondary stroke prevention, and how to uh, navigate our, our social welfare system. We also have a WhatsApp group for young stroke survivors, and as of yesterday, we have 141 members. When new members are added, we're often flooded with questions, which is soon followed by exclamations of relief. For some people, it's the first opportunity they've had to talk to other stroke survivors or to open up about their diagnosis. We provide advice, share our stories and celebrate all types of wins and mark our stroke anniversaries or birthdays. So thankfully, I'm only four and a half years old now. We also make sure to point out our recovery journeys are all different and we will hit obstacles or achieve goals at different stages along the way. We have weekly in-person young stroke survivor exercise class where we concentrate on things such as cardio, strength, balance, coordination, and it's adapted to take into account people's different physical abilities post-stroke. This peer connection is so important to us that so many people who've returned to work part time make sure to take Wednesdays off work so they can still attend the um, exercise classes. And we also go for coffee afterwards and have chats. Being part of a, a group of people who are both older and younger than me means I'm no longer feeling isolated. I get support from friends who understand and who can provide guidance and knowledge from their first hand experience. Initially post-stroke, I found it difficult to remember simple exercises such as sit-ups, lunges, squats, etc. So I went to a personal trainer. I now take part in a variety of exercises daily. I am more mindful of what I eat, but I think it's very important to still remain flexible and to have fun along the way. I attended counselling before I had a stroke, so it was important for me to be able to link back in with her after it. He or she explained to me the importance of establishing a routine while I'm not in work and how to build purpose around my day. Acceptance that I had a stroke has never been an issue for me, but I do get frustrated with the changes that I'm left with, which can still cause me some difficulties. It can take me longer to cook, fatigue can be crippling and words can desert me at times. And I am always late to everything, even though I do try my best to counteract this. I still do have some difficulties with reading, comprehension and memory. I was also very lucky to be able to avail of the services of Acquired Brain Injury Ireland, the National Rehabilitation Hospital and Headway. 
before the next few slides, I just want to clarify that any issues encountered is not any specific individual's fault or it's not a personal attack. It's more of an overall system failure or difficulty. And I imagine there are policy practices, et cetera, that I don't really understand or know about, so or that you may be bound. But in saying that, here are some suggestions. Treat the patient, not the condition. Every stroke is different from the cause to the treatment to the damage done. Every patient has different needs, even if we do all fall under the same stroke bracket. We're still all individuals. Same goes for chronic diseases like arthritis, kidney disease, asthma, etc. Provide information of where patients, their carers and families can get help. While this may be an everyday occurrence to medical professionals, for patients and their families having a lifelong condition or life altering event, it is something that we never anticipated. It's incredibly upsetting and stressful, so it may take us longer to process information that could be deemed straightforward in other circumstances. We may not know what rehab services we need or what a specific intervention actually involves. And it's important to take a collaborative approach when it comes to our treatment and recoveries. As we improve, improve and get used to life after stroke or life with a chronic disease, new difficulties do often emerge. We're still expected to meet the societal expectations of getting married, having children, excelling in our careers, buying a home, but we're also at a disadvantage due to our condition. We need ongoing support that we can dip into and out of as these, as these life changes arise. As patients, we've also suffered financially. We may have been out of work and not earning while trying to recover. And a lot of us do still pay privately for rehabilitation. It's also important to remember that living with a chronic disease is a lifelong issue and it's exhausting. Sometimes the return to work means that people forget that we aren't fully recovered, even just getting up, dressed, making lunch, putting on makeup and then commuting can be a challenge before the workday even begins. So we might need accommodations to be made for us in our work environment, whether it's a four day week, a room to rest in, a lighter workload or extended deadlines. Females may also have additional needs when it comes to contraception or family planning. And this is something that I and others have found very difficult to, to navigate. It's now four years, four and a half years since I had my stroke, and it's only now that contraception is being sorted for me. I've always been told not to get pregnant or that if I were to get pregnant, I would have to be carefully monitored. My medication would have to be changed and due to risk of placing pressure on my brain, I couldn't give birth vaginally. If I have trouble conceiving, conceiving, my understanding is I more than likely cannot do IVF as I can't run risk of putting hormones into my body. There seems to be no joined up communication among all of these departments. I'm waiting months for referrals and then again for appointments. And at the age of 37, time really isn't on my side if I want to start a family. What I aim for in my recovery may differ to somebody else. For a lot of us, we continue our recovery. We realise that holistic healing far outweighs career progression and perhaps the new me is better than the old me ever was. And I imagine it's similar for other patients with chronic diseases. Everyone's goals are individuals and their needs need, their needs need to be managed. A life worth saving is a life worth living and we want to have a life that is close to normal as possible. Proper funding saves money long term. Stroke recovery or indeed any disease is a huge economic cost for our country. There are more stroke survivors than ever thanks to medical advancement, but it means that more people avail of rehab. It is vital to have more up to date and precise number of patients to be able to know how much staff and resources are needed. Proper funding is needed for early and timely interventions for everyone so that we will hopefully make quicker recoveries, be back to work sooner and paying taxes. I feel that if I had gotten earlier interventions, it would have made a huge difference to me and I may not have needed support for so long and this would have left the resources free for others to avail of. I know I'm probably preaching to the converted on the next point, but where you live should not dictate the level of care you receive. Hospitals and clinics nationwide should be able to provide every patient with all the medical interventions necessary to aid the recovery or manage their condition. 
Services cannot be improved unless patients' experiences are acknowledged and acted on. It makes a huge difference to know that patient voices are being sought and heard. We're finally getting to the stage where academia, medical professionals and patients are collaborating to effect change for future treatments and interventions. Effective communication, don't assume understanding, ensure understanding. Use plain English when talking to patients, their families. Ask them to repeat back what is said and don't use medical terminology or acronyms that patients or their families may not understand. Referrals need to be made to professionals of that field every single time. If as a GP, a, GP, a consultant or nurse, etc., you're wondering, does this patient need psychological support, chronic pain management, speech and language therapy, then refer them on. Let the expert in that specific area have a consult, consult, consultation with the patient, perform the assessment needed, and then they can decide how to progress the patient's care. And it's important that signposting so to me, signposting is key, whether it's inside the HSC or to other outside agencies who can provide support. So some of my final thoughts as patients, we are when we are discharged home, we have to fight for ourselves, regardless of whether we can form thoughts, speak, read or write. When we are deemed physically fit, we are left to fend for ourselves. It's exhausting being sick and yet we still have to fight for ourselves. I'm lucky in that I've come full circle and I can advocate for other patients through the stroke patient panel. And um, I'm also involved with the patient partnership research with the RCSI and I represent patients on different forums and committee. It's really important to me to help make changes for others coming behind me on their recovery journeys. And I'm able to do this by speaking at the Eructus or um, about disability awareness. I also presented at the SAFE conference in Rome last year and at the European Life After Stroke conference earlier this week. Peer support is the part that is closest to my heart. I first spoke at a Life After Stroke talk for stroke survivors about my difficulties and my recovery journey. So many of the audience approached me privately to thank me for putting into words how they were feeling. They didn't realise that others felt the same and that they were suffering alone and in silence. Studies have proved that when a person is feeling low, the outcome of their treatments or rehabilitation will not be effect as effective. We must normalise talking about the difficulties and mental health issues so effective support can be provided. I wasn't actually supposed to be promoting the Irish Heart Foundation at all, but they do genuinely turn everything around for me. They helped me with my holistic healing. They provided information and emotional support was given to me. They also helped me to re regain my confidence and my voice. And I think that sometimes the support from charities and organisations can be undervalued. Finally, to all of you our healthcare and medical professionals, I'm incredibly aware that you work in difficult, challenging and high pressured environments. You don't have all the resources you need to complete your job, be that money, staff or time. But please don't underestimate the value of what you provide and are trying to achieve. It doesn't go unnoticed by patients and families. I'm sure you very rarely get the recognition and appreciation you deserve, but as patients, you do make a huge difference to our lives and to our recoveries and for that we're very grateful. Thanks very much. Thank you Fiona uh, for a, a really fantastic uh, overview um, and I can see from from all of the comments and all of the engagement that you've you've touched a chord with the audience so, so thank you again. I think sometimes we talk about integrated care and we have personas in our in our minds of, of what we mean. But I think your 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 story uh, is a, is a very obvious and real life example of of why integrated care is so important and why we need to prioritize it uh, in in its widest sense across across the sector. Um, I might give you a break for a second, Fiona, and 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 bring in Patricia and and Ed uh, for a couple of questions, and I'll come back to you before the end. Um, so Patricia, I think a piece for me that, that you touched on was like, obviously we have clear evidence um, that of, of substantial improvement around outcomes for chronic disease over, over recent decades and, and, and in particular over the last two decades, I think in Ireland. Um, 
but but you showed also the evidence of the of the of the gap between the most and least disadvantaged in our society uh, and certainly it feels for me that that we haven't grasped that nettle um and i just wonder if you've thoughts on 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 where we go like obviously healthy ireland obviously the chronic disease management program there's lots of really good stuff happening but what do we do next to 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 really tackle these issues in those who are most disadvantaged uh, thanks, Ronan. So I think maybe two things. One, uh, Marmot, who I know Ed also uh, referenced, talks about um, universal proportionalism. And I think we need to be very explicit about that, that while we might put in place, uh, you know, systems or structures that are universal, so um, care that is free to all at the point of care, but recognise that for some groups we need to work harder and I think um, that phrase, you know, rather than the hard to reach, the easy to ignore and being really very open in our discussions about that, that we do need to do things differently, that yes, we are making progress, but um, for the more disadvantaged, we need to work harder, think harder, think differently outside the box, you know, and and also work. And, you know, we heard very clearly from Fiona there, the patient experience. So having the voice of those who are more disadvantaged or are not getting the services they need be part of the solution. And then the other thing I would say is around data. Um, for me, a lot, it often comes back to data. And so the whole idea of equity stratifiers, for example. And so thinking about our national data sets, thinking about whether we have in place the information. So whether that's, um, gender, whether it's ethnicity, place of residence, education level, and um, so that we can actually identify who it is who is not achieving the same health outcomes. And then we can use that data be to better inform the, the strategies that, that, that we're putting in place. OK, thanks. And, and, and then maybe for yourself or Greg, Greg from, from that perspective. So so let's say we have the data or we or we get the data. Um, you know, I think across your presentations, it was made clear that that by intervening early, we're avoiding this higher cost of higher cost of acute care. Um, but I wonder to what extent either of you have a perspective on how we might better, not necessarily use the data, but better communicate the evidence uh, to ensure that a greater proportion of budget is spent on prevention and early intervention, as opposed to uh, as opposed to maybe as it is currently spent, accepting the challenges that we have on treating those who need it today. Sure, I'll add to that. I mean, um, I'll add to Patricia's comment on on having the data. I think that what the, the key challenge once we have that is actually being able to dig deep into understand whether um, interventions are being applied to those that are in the socioeconomic risk groups that we're concerned about. Um, and I think that what we tend to have is we have hard outcomes at the end, right? We, 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 it's, it's easier for us to know whether people are dying younger or later if you're in a, in a deprived setting. But I think that, for example, as we see um, new chronic care programs rolled out, if we could actually strive to really um, have a, a very aggressive surveillance and monitoring program to understand whether all groups are being, whether the, whether it's at the access level, whether it's a management level and, and how those interventions are being rolled out, I think that that um, could make a big difference here. Okay, and then, so obviously, at this, we've referenced the great progress that has been made, um, but the, and a question came in on this. There is an argument that in some ways that progress has stagnated over recent years. Um, um, with that in mind, and I know, Ed, you broke it down into the, the various uh, levels and, and areas of priority, but um, to what extent do you think we need to, to, to uh, I know we need to focus on all, but to what extent do you think we need to put more of an emphasis on, on determinants that traditionally sit outside of the health sector? So whether that's education, housing, um, et cetera, um, and to bring those sectors more into the conversation around chronic disease and, and how, how we prevent and, and intervene earlier. 
Well, I, I, um, I, I tend to think we have to take a balanced approach in all of them. Um, you know, the, the thing about the health systems approaches that we use, those that are focused on individuals, unfortunately, that's where most of our evidence and research for intervention effectiveness sits. So when we go to the, the, the broader problems outside or, or potential solutions outside the healthcare system, unfortunately, we, um, it, you know, it's harder to generate, for example, experimental or trial evidence. Um, I think that if we could actually take advantage of the the uh, new data systems that are being developed to improve our basically natural experiments to try to understand as we embark on these programs, whether they're being effective or not, um, I think that can make a difference. Um, but I, I'd, I'd hesitate to say we, we need to shift. I think that we need a balanced approach always between health system and um, community and, um, and, you know, extra health system approaches. OK, thanks, Ed. Fiona, um, uh, just your, your comment on language and the, I guess, the avoidance or the reluctance of healthcare professionals to to use the word stroke really struck me as as you told your story. Um, I guess, first of all, if you have any further reflections on that, it would be interesting. But I guess as part of that, I suppose part part of my question is, is um, we, we have had a traditional multidisciplinary team across healthcare for, for many decades. And I guess the, the extent to which you think we need new roles like health coaches, uh, patient navigators within within the traditional health system, as opposed to perhaps relying on roles like that in organisations like the Irish Heart Foundation. Um, I just wonder if you have a perspective on that, given your given your experiences. Yeah, I think for things like stroke or heart disease or anything, we all know that if you get cancer, that a lot of us would have to have radiation treatment, or you'd have to go undergo chemotherapy or some sort of operation. That it's it's quite common like it's it's people know what's happening and what the general treatments is but for things like stroke it's unknown territory for a lot of us that until we experience it or so someone in our family experiences it we don't know what the road is and i suppose even though s stroke is only one word there's uh, there's so many um difficulties that people may face whether it's cognitive physical emotional that that just because you've had a stroke not every patient has the same issues after the stroke so if there was someone working in a hospital or if there was someone working within Dublin or Leinster or Ulster or whatever county you're living in who knew how to navigate each section or who knew where the different supports were and that you could contact and then they could tell you all the information it would be great and then you wouldn't have to continually go, do I need to go to a speech and language therapist? Do I need to go to a vocational therapist? Do I need to get physio? That that one person would have all the information that people need. And they are working on that in other countries. And from being at the SAFE conference in October and again, the, the conference earlier in Dublin this week, they're trying to kind of make the um, the after care treatment of stroke more consistent across Europe. So hopefully within the next few years, there will be something coming down the line to help patients and their families. OK, thank you. Thank you, Fiona. And I'll give the, I'm just conscious of time, so I'll give the final word to you on that. Um, I just want to really take the opportunity to thank our three speakers. I think we've had a greater level of engagement in terms of questions coming in than I've seen in, in, in any of our previous uh, uh, webinars. So, so you, you've really generated interest and say thank you for, for that and sorry to our audience that we can't get to all of those questions. Um, I'll just finish by uh, reminding people that the next uh, the next webinar in this series will take place on Thursday, the 2nd of May. And we'll be looking specifically at uh, policy interventions that can help in terms of preventing chronic, chronic disease. Um, so more details will, will, will uh, be communicated around that in advance. And I look forward to seeing many of you uh, uh, on the 2nd of May. So thanks again to our speakers and thanks to, to everybody for joining. Thank you.